17 million people, 7,000 islands. Yeah, the Philippines are one hell of a big place. It's a good idea for you to know something about this country and the people that live in it. Let's go back 400 years to 1521. That's the year Magellan sailed into this place on his way around the world. He landed on the island of Samar in the middle of the group. The Philippines got their name from Magellan's boss, Spanish King Philip, the great-grandson of Ferdinand and Isabella who financed Columbus. Incidentally, Magellan made the mistake about a month later of leading an invasion. He got into a scrap with some of the natives. His round-the-world cruise came to a quick finish here on the island of Mactan. This is Magellan's monument. The Philippine hombres were tough fighters then, and they're still tough. Don't like invaders. Don't like Japs. See this cathedral? And this one? The architecture is Spanish. Here's part of an old Spanish wall. Philippine money. Get the name, peso. That's Spanish too. You'll find lots of Spain all through the Philippines. Reason? The Spaniards ran the Philippines for three centuries. That brings us right up to 1898. This is where we came in. Admiral Dewey. Fire when ready, Gridley. Battle of Manila. Too bad you can't see this in action. We didn't have a signal corps combat camera crew around in those days. Yeah, that's when we came in, the first time. For the past 40 years, 17 million Filipinos shared Uncle Sam with 130 million Americans. They have many universities, among them the Great State University of the Philippines. This is the University of Santo Tomas. They've been studying here for more than three centuries. Silliman University on the island of Negros. No studying here during the occupation. The Japs used the classrooms for army barracks. They learned the three R's American style in high schools, grade schools, everything taught in English. Kindergarten, just like at home. They shared our daily setting ups. School for farming. The Filipinos also shared another kind of American school tradition. One of the U.S. Army's oldest and best, our West Point. It's the general. This picture was taken before the war, when he was in command of the military defense of the Philippines. There were some Americans who saw the need for organizing the defense of the Philippines long before the war. Working with the Philippine government, they set out to build a tight, hard army of Philippine regulars. Even long before Pearl Harbor, the Jap menace was there, ambushed behind diplomatic lingo and grins. Maybe you'll get to see the military academy on Luzon. It's modeled after our own West Point, right down to the uniforms and precision drilling of the cadets. The Filipino GIs were trained like us. We shared with them in this, too. There were four of these tough Filipino GIs for every American fighting and dying on Bataan and Corregidor. They've shared the fighting. They'll share the final victory parade. Supreme Court of the Philippines. They shared our long tradition of justice. Those fine intelligent faces are the faces of civilized men, guarding the laws of a civilized nation, dealing in civilized justice, a term that Tokyo criminals don't understand. And here is their House of Congress, the Filipino legislators built their constitution based on ours. They made their laws as we do, by the consent of the governed. Laws for the Filipinos, by the Filipinos. They had a president. When the Japs invaded, he set up a government in exile in Washington. 
to be ready for the day when we would liberate the Philippines and once more bring it into the society of free nations. His name, Manuel Quezon. Quezon did not live to see this moment of liberation. He died in America. But his vice president, Sergio Osmania, is carrying on the same fight. Like Quezon, the second president of the Philippine Commonwealth wants only to see his country and his people living in independence. They are a deeply religious people. 90% of them are Christians. The Philippines is the only Christian nation in the Far East. They've been Christian ever since the Spaniards first got there. Like us, they are a mixture of a lot of races. If you hit a beach like this down south on the island of Mindanao, you'll meet this kind of Filipino citizen, the Moro. The Moros are Mohammedans. They look peaceful here, but they can fight like hell. Their favorite weapon is the bolo, a wicked piece of steel a top sergeant could shave with. They use it on everything, including their enemies. They fought the Spaniards for over 300 years. After 1898, they fought us. Blackjack Pershing battled against them in his captain's bars long before he battled against the fathers of the Nazis at Chateau Thierry and the Argonne. In 1913, they buried the bolo as an instrument of war and took it up as a tool for peace and prosperity. They joined hands with the rest of the peace-loving Filipinos and earned their right to independence. Their biggest town is a place you've been hearing about, Zamboanga, the place where monkeys have no tails. That's one of the monks. See? Just a stump of a tail. When we get in, the Moros may put on a USO dance for us. It'll be like this. These Moros are a race of Filipinos with a culture and traditions, with manners, with beautiful clothes, and with pride in themselves. They have learned to trust us because we have learned to trust and respect them as fellow Americans. They dance, but they're hardworking. You might see a Moro woman husking rice like this, or you might see this kind of human transportation, or this kind of house moving, or you might see this on Saturday night or this on Monday morning, and this every day in the week. A lot of them earn their living out of the sea. Look, Joe, don't be surprised if around midday you suddenly find yourself all alone on a street. It's another old Spanish custom, siesta time. Get set for hot weather. We're right around the equator. March to May is generally the hottest time of the year. The heat is usually sticky, sweaty. But don't kid yourself. Siesta or not, these people know how to work and have plenty of big-time jobs to work at. Lumber, big timber, mahogany, hardwoods. The foothills and mountains on the islands are covered with them. The Japs had their eyes slanted on this stuff, saw it in terms of planes and ships long before we stopped thinking they were just dream boys. But millions of feet of good lumber was deliberately destroyed by the Filipinos before the Japs had a chance to grab it. Sugar cane. Thousands of acres under cultivation. The Filipino sugar bowl was one of the world's biggest and richest. More than a million men and women kept filling it. It went out by boatloads. Coconuts. The Japanese wanted control of this business, too. Know why? Coconut oil makes glycerin. Glycerin makes high explosives. 
High explosives make supermen. Supermen make war. Rubber. The Philippines have this white gold growing in their backyards. Tobacco. Cutting it. Bringing it in. Here in one of the factories, they're rolling the leaf. Perfectos. Stogies. Maybe rope. But it all adds up to a big time business. And here's the real rope, the McCoy, manila hemp, grown from the ground up. The most famous and oldest industry in the 7,000 islands. This man slicing the fibers of the abaca plant. Shredding out the long, tough strands. It's dried. then twined. Back in the old Nantucket Clipper days, Yankee traders tied up with manila hemp in ports over the seven seas. War or peace, it's still sailing the seven seas. No other country comes even near producing as much. Factories, machines, workers handling every kind of skilled job. The kind of people that can run their own country the kind of people that want peace in the Far East. But also the kind of people that started learning a new job on the double. A trigger squeezing job we taught them while the Japs were landing. The kind of people that went into the hills as guerrillas and fought the Jap army for two years because they knew what they wanted, knew what they had to do to get it. The kind of people that got into GI issue and trained in American camps. The kind of people that are marching back with you. The kind of people that idolize this American because he stands for everything we promised and are doing for the Philippines. The kind of people that want their children to grow up as our kids will grow up in a world without fascist dictators. Yeah, we're coming back to those 7,000 islands, to those 17 million Americans. This isn't just another movie. Take it from me. These people aren't natives. They aren't beggars. They have cities and farms and industries. They have schools and courts and a constitution. They also have pride and patriotism and self-respect. They love freedom. They'll die for it. They have died for it. Don't throw your money around. For two years, the Japs have looted the Philippines, and there's probably very little left in the stores for the 17 millions who live there. Don't get out of line, either. For years, the Japs have smeared anti-American propaganda in China, Burma, Malaya, and among the millions of Filipinos. They filled them full of lies about us. Don't give them a chance to broadcast, I told you so. Just one word more. It's a word that covers a lot of ground. It covers 48 states. It covers 7,000 islands. The word is American. The Filipinos are American. Treat them like Americans. And Joe, don't for one day, one hour, one minute, ever forget that last message sent by a GI who saw his starved comrades, Americans and Filipinos, dying around him at Corregidor. What you are about to hear now is a transcript of the radio messages that came out of Fort Mills Corregidor on May 5th. They're not near yet. We are waiting for God only knows what. The white flag is up. Everyone is bawling like a baby. They're piling dead, wounded soldiers in our tunnel. Corregidor used to be a nice place. It's haunted now. Get this to my mother. My love to Pa, Joe, Sue, Matt, 
Carrie, Joy, and Paul. Tell Joe, wherever he is, give him hell for us. Joe, you know who he means. Give him hell. Keep giving him hell till we get to Tokyo. Thank you.